Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anderson Lay. I'm the artistic director for the Hawaii International Film Festival. And thanks for coming to uh, this live virtual panel called Shirls in the Kitchen. Um, and this is a, you know, our live panel is part of the Eat Drink Film virtual showcase that is happening right now. I hope you are enjoying this, this like uh, showcase of uh, culinary cinema. It's a feast for your eyes and also hopefully for your stomach as well. Uh, and in ordering um, from the various uh, community partners and restaurants that we have that are supporting Eat Drink Film. Um, so before we start, um, I just want to let you know that the, the Eat Drink Film Showcase is happening right now and it ends on July, uh, June 20th this weekend. And um, this is our third uh, showcase for this year uh, after a very successful Indigenous Lens and um, also the J-Fest last month. And, and we are having one more virtual showcase next month, uh, Viva La Cinema, which is our French cinema showcase, uh, which will be entirely virtual and online. Uh, for more information, just go to our website at hif.org, and we're going to make an announcement of the um, of the the French uh, film lineup um, very shortly. Um, but in the meantime, we're here for Eat Drink Film, and um, and thank you again for joining the Shiro's in the Kitchen virtual panel. Um, it's basically um, it's, this panel is inspired by the documentary Her Name Is Chef, which is playing as uh, part of the uh, Eat Drink Film showcase, which spotlights six badass, inspiring Shiro's of the kitchen. Uh, this panel will invite uh, women chefs and food activists from Hawaii uh, to discuss their careers in one of the nation's most exciting culinary scenes, as well as issues involving gender parity, workers' rights, food sustainability, and the many challenges faced in the wake of a global pandemic and the future trends of an industry uh, in crisis. Um, so before we, uh, we start the panel, I'm going to introduce each panelist and then our moderator. So we start off with um, uh, Chef Leanne Wong. Uh, Leanne was a contestant on the first season of Top Chef in San Francisco and later returned via Top Chef Last Chance Kitchen for season 15. Following her Top Chef debut in 20, 2006, Leanne was hired as a series um, supervising culinary producer for the next six seasons, helping to build the show into what it is today. A native of Troy, New York, she graduated from the International Culinary Center, formerly known as the French Culinary Institute, and began her culinary training at Marcus Samuelson's Aquavit. Uh, before playing an integral role in the opening of John George's uh, Chinese concept restaurant 66. In late 2013, she moved from New York to Honolulu and in 2014 opened Cocoa Head Cafe, an island style brunch house in the Kamiki neighborhood. Opening to popular acclaim, she was recognized in the cover of Honolulu Magazine, has been featured in Bon Appetit, Food and Wine, The New York Times, Honolulu Star Advertiser, and Huffington Post. In August of 2014, Leanne released her first cookbook, Dumplings All Day Wong. Most recently, she moved to Maui with her husband and son to open Papa Aina at Pioneer Inn, Maui's first and oldest hotel located on the waterfront in historic Lahaina. Thank you, Leanne, for joining us. Hi, aloha. Aloha. Uh, next, we have Sharice Julita Kawi Keolani Sana. Kawi was born and raised in Waianae. She's a graduate of Waianae High School and joined Mao Organic Farms, a, non a nonprofit uh, Native Hawaiian social enterprise venture whose mission is to grow certified organic veggies and youth leaders. As an intern, she learned um, organic farming practices, food systems, social and food justice, and aloha aina, aina aloha practices. While being in the um, organic produce for her, well, sorry, while being in the inter internship, she experienced how to plant, wash, pack, and sell fresh organic produce for her community. Learning Ma'o Organic Farm's core values of love, respect, and the willingness to work, she has been able to apply these values to be a leader in her community and in, to her family. Kawi received an A from Leeward Community College and a BA in Hawaiian Studies at the UH Manoa. Kawi is currently the general manager of Mao Organic Farms. With her team, she helps to manage the organic farm operations while mentoring young adults from the community through their college pathway, all while producing two tons of organic produce a week. Wow. Welcome, Kawi. And then we have uh, next, we have Chef Robin Ma'i. Uh, born and raised in Honolulu, Robin is chef and owner of award winning restaurant Fets in Chinatown, Honolulu. Uh, Robin has a culinary and pastry arts degree from KCC, a dance degree from Middlebury in Vermont, and a master in food studies from NYU. She began her culinary adventure at 3660 on the rise, cooking under Chef Russell Sue and Padovani's Bistro and Wine Bar, where she transitioned to a full-time pastry chef under Chef Pierre Padovani. In 1999, she moved to New York City, where she moved where she worked at Union Pacific under Chef Rocco Desperito and the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in their pastry 
Banquet Kitchen, which is led by Chef Jean-Claude Perrineau. Robin worked for Gourmet Magazine, City University of New York, and has been a cookbook judge for the prestigious James Beard Foundation Award since 2004. In 2018, uh, in the fall of 2018, FET partnered with Hawaiian, Hawaiian Airlines to run Hawaiian Airlines corporate restaurant Lunchbox. The restaurant is located inside Hawaiian headquarters. This fall, she opens her new restaurant, Hey Day, at the newly restored White Sands Hotel in Waikiki. Welcome, Chef. Thank you. Uh, and then finally, for our moderator, we have uh, uh, the incomparable Martha Cheng. Martha is based in Honolulu. Her writing appears in publications including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Food and Wine, Eater, Monaco, and Connie Nas, Nas Traveler. She is also the food editor for Honolulu Magazine. In past lives, she's ran a grilled cheese truck, cooked in restaurants as a, as a line cook, worked as, worked as a Google techie, and was also a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, she also was uh, part of the inception of my brother's restaurant, Pig and a Lady, many, many years ago. Uh, and you know, the, the, you know, those, those uh, famous uh, pop-ups in Kakaako. And uh, she has degrees in creative science and English from Wellesley College. So Martha, thank you for moderating this panel and uh, please take it away. Okay. You're muted. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, thanks for joining us. I'm so glad to be in the company of these chefs and farmer. Um, I think it's funny because our agenda was, it so-called was a tackling gender parity, workers' rights, food sustainability, the challenges in the wake of COVID and future trends of an industry in crisis <laughs> all in one hour. Um, but I do think these are actually things that you guys are all thinking of almost all the time, especially in your industries. So um, the first thing I wanted to address, because that's what we're ostensibly all here for, is um, I've in the movie that, um, that we watched <laughs> that inspired this panel, um, there were some women, I think, that don't want to be known as women chefs or farmers because you would never address, you would never introduce a male chef as a male chef or a male farmer. But I think for others, they've also embraced it as part of their experience. So I'm curious for each of you, how much do you think about your gender and profession? Um, well, I'll, I'll chime in on that. I mean, it's, you know, I'm from New York. I kind of hit that last generation of um, the, the old school fine dining kitchens uh, where sometimes you got yelled at or somebody threw a pan at you. I don't know. Um, but it's, you know, I think proportionally speaking, obviously there are less women cooking professionally. Um, I think that when I became a mother, it was a very that was kind of the, the, the fork in the road where it's like, I can continue to do this or I could figure out something else to do in this field that wouldn't require so much of my time and energy, but of course I'm crazy. So <laughs> we're going with restaurants for now. Um, and, um, you know, I, I just feel that in general, it, it has been a male field. I think that in terms of, you know, you look at what's happening in the media and press with certain situations, like there's a new, um, you know, for example, there's a, a, a Michelin starred best restaurant in the world that's going vegan and the press is going bananas over it. But Amanda Cohen's had dirt candy for over a decade, you know, so it's like, you know, it, 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 it's sort of like, it's just very interesting how the media plays into very much the male chef world and, and glorifying the male chef. And I remember that, that gods of that gods of food, the gods of cooking, the time magazine article that maybe I think it like gave Alice waters a mention, you know, like it gave Julia child a mention, you know, and it's like, you know, it, it's it, a lot of it has to do with perception. Um, but it's not to say there aren't an incredible, incredible women throughout this industry in this field that maybe don't, crave the attention and the press and the media the same way that say a male chef might we're too busy working <laughs> <laughs> too busy working you're still you working around. i'm still working yeah. <laughs> also actually robin your uh, kitchen is mostly Women, is that correct? Is it still? Um, it, you know, it's gone through. Can you hear me? Yes. 
okay, it's gone through a different, I mean, right now it's pretty 50, 50. Um, I always thought that I was like, Oh, I'm going to have a kitchen full of women, but you know what? It, it, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like what I've learned, is like you, it, the, the baseline for working at set is that you have to be, you have to be kind hearted and you have to be generous spirited. Like that's like the bare minimum. If, if you, if you come with like good cooking skills, awesome. And then we can teach you how we do things here. But um, we've had, we've had great uh, guy, guy cooks come through. We've had great lady cooks that come through. Um, it's just about fostering. I think for me, it's this idea of, does it have to be this environment where everyone is unhappy? Right? Like, and you know, I, Russell Sue, who, who is my first chef, I like went into work terrified every day. Like I thought I was going to vomit because I was the only woman, well, aside from his ex-wife who did the pastries, but like, you know what I mean? Like it was just like, I didn't think anyone was going to help me. Um, and then New York City was a whole next level of crazy. You know what I mean? Like Russell's kitchen was like really nice compared to the working in New York City where all the things that you hear about, you read about, that's in Anthony Bourdain's book, all of that is true. It's all true. Right, Leanne? It's all true. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, there's, there's definitely when you encounter like, yeah, in New York, there was definitely a little bit more misogyny if I could yes. <laughs> just yes. to be plain. Yeah. So, so and again, that's me, perception. Yes. I, I just wanted, I knew we could do things better. And, and, and then maybe it's because women are inherently more nurturing. Maybe it's because we're more patient. Maybe it's because we're more detail oriented. Maybe it's because we're really into like walking the, walking the talk, like, you know, like being in there every single day, like, you know, the repetition showing, um, whereas like, you know, lots of my chefs are just like, why don't you know? Why don't you know? Or they just ignored me. Really. I, I got a lot of like, polar opposites I was either like so much attention because I was female because they wanted to have sex with me or zero attention because I was actually doing a good job but nobody wanted to tell me that I was doing a good job god forbid so um, that's crazy <laughs> but I'm, gonna say one, I wanna, I'm gonna say one more thing and then I want to hear it from Sharif because um you know we we buy so much local and we, you know, we buy, we buy from everyone, but there is, I have to say this, the women farmers are, they grow the most beautiful produce. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't know what they do, but it, it is true. It is like, it's, and it's not like, it's just, it's, it's not so much like the produce is beautiful, but it's the way that the produce is brought in to the restaurant. It's washed better. It's like, it's, it's just more lovingly, it just arrives, just like perfection. Whereas like the guy, the guy farmers is just like sturdy and it's like, you know, whatever. And we, and they make beautiful, they grow beautiful things too. And it's the same thing with the animals. Like, you know, we buy two lady farmers pork and the animals are like just pristine. And we've bought, uh, we've, you know, other animals from, from, not the two lady farmers and it's just different it's so good but it's it's just not as perfect <laughs> yeah what is it like in the ag world Chase? oh well like for for me I, i've so i've been on the farm for 14 years and i came straight out of high school into the youth leadership training programs here and for most of my time here you know i guess to answer like your your gender question is like they're predominantly the wahine perform at a high higher level at more capacities um it's there it's um the the management of how they, they take in, in in consideration of you know people's feelings having empathy you know maybe mm -hmm. that just the natural nurturing mm -hmm. and the, the malama that we want to do for each individual um and and I think that's just embedded in us, right? So maybe on our farm, like it's you for for years, it's probably been about like a 
sixty percent, sixty-five, almost seventy percent in some years, verse um of women of young of young women helping to be in the programs, um in the leadership teams. It's been pretty steady, more than it's about sixty to seventy percent, depending on the year as we transition people into the farm. Um, there's a lot of you know women farmers that that are around and, and they're they're kicking ass like they're being badass they're they're on tractors they're growing beautiful beautiful stuff and it's i think it's just that um having that acknowledgement of like we see each other i think is is super important in building that relationship especially with food right because food transfers energy and and food to me um where i'm at is in the raw stage and producing it for for people like these guys like these women um is such a it's such a humbling like act to do in order to like share share energies and to like share you know food um it's just a transference of knowledge and and history right and we get to change that we get to add that we get to um have that kind of um, narrative that we own because we're the ones doing it. So, um, on our farm, um, you know, like for me, when I when I work with the interns here, and we just onboarded about forty eight young interns um, in our summer programs, and there are like a bunch of seventeen, eighteen, nineteen year olds, right? It's like this is probably their first job working, and they're working on a farm. You know, it's like so we're in week two, but. And every summer we get to a point where we, at some point we talk about the energies of Ku and Hina because our kupuna, right, our ancestors understood that every person has like a masculine side and a feminine side. And some people are both, which, and they're special, right? The mahu in our community are special. The gay people in our community are special. And our, our kupuna honored that, right? So there are people who could do both. And then there's people who are just more, cool and more, you know, you know, more masculine and more feminine. So finding that balance um, and, you know, like sharing that and making it an understanding has been really core for us on the farm to making sure that, you know, things are pono because dealing with food is important and it's a sacred app. And we want to make sure that the food that does go out um, feeds people physically, spiritually and mentally, you know, so yeah. Wow, I love that you guys integrate that into the, the the training or the yeah it's the dailiness i mean it's probably just in your like how you folks have in your guys kitchen it's just it's just a culture mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. you get trained and then like people are just like it becomes a practice it becomes who you are it it becomes you right and, and it becomes your team then it becomes a community and it's like mm -hmm. it's it it translates into like ohana right so it and it, it takes steps because we it's it's lots of different people and everyone comes with their own manao their own history and um their ups and their downs so it's like a big puzzle piece you know to try mm -hmm. and figure out how to make a working team and a positive a positive workspace yeah mm -hmm. yeah I like that i really do like addressing people's personal histories as you come together it helps you i'd imagine yeah work better together okay. oh. Um, like you said about food being, working with food being a sacred act, and I can't think of very many other industries, maybe no other ones though, where it's so celebrated and everyone participates in it and um, everyone's affected by the food industry, and yet the people who work in it are so underpaid, underappreciated. Um, I think workers' rights are just kind of swept under the table in the industry a lot. I was reading recently too, the um, UCSF did a study and they said um, line cooks had the highest mortality rate in the height of the pandemic in the US. Um, so as, and I don't, you know, farmers and restaurant workers don't get paid a lot. What kinds of things do you think we can do to address this? Um, so, <laughs> It's interesting because I, we closed down when the pandemic hit, we were like, Lahaina was full one day and then it was shut down the next. And, uh, we were only closed for about a month and a half and then we reopened uh, in May and the hotel was open, but there was nobody on here. They weren't letting anybody onto the island. It was just like Lahaina turned into a ghost town. 
Um, they said that Kahului and Lahaina were maybe the like in the top five towns in America that were economically affected by the pandemic. And you know what what's interesting is as people start to come out of their house, as people are vaccinated, um, obviously there's been a lot of talk on the internet of and every restaurant across the country is dealing with shortages in terms of employees. Um, what's interesting is is the customer's perception that things are just going back to normal. It yeah. might seem normal for them. However, we're doing the output that we would be, you know, with half the staff. Um, and so when we talk about the pay disparity and we talk about, um, you know, what to fix and, and obviously issues with front of the house, the disparity of wage between front of the house and back of the house. I mean, at the end of the day, we work in an industry that has, you know, 10% razor thin margins. You know, it's like if you have a good year, you've made 10%, right? <laughs> like, um, so within that, you know, we talk about living wage. We live in, you know, in the state of Hawaii. Thankfully, we as, as businesses, we are, we provide health insurance to our employees. I think every state should have to do that. Um, but customers at the end of the day need to understand that they need to pay more for food period the cost of doing business the cost of a full service restaurant customer perception and value is what they see in front of them what's on the plate they don't think about the water bill the electricity the napkins the dishwasher the soap that we go through i mean just just the soap that i have on my like my in my dish pit like we go through I mean, we spend thousands of dollars every week, you know, just on like making sure that everything's clean and presentable, you know? And so at all these fixed costs that we have in the restaurant, customers don't understand that. They don't perceive that, you know? And they're like, oh, well, this is, this is takeout. I'm going to leave a 5% tip, you know? Um, I didn't get, I didn't get weighted on hand and foot. I'm going to leave 10%, you know? And, and really... Unfortunately, we're a country where our restaurant system and especially, um, you know, front of the house has depended on customer tips for, for, to supplement their wages. Um, when you go to another country, you go to Europe, it's not like that. You know, um, I think that it's a really interesting time where I'm trying to restructure my restaurant where uh, when we go to a quick service, we're currently full service dining, but we're going to be transform. Um, transitioning to a quick service where a majority of that labor is coming out of my kitchen, like the food and, and a majority of the labor is coming out of the kitchen. So we're a pool tip house. And now my kitchen is getting a, a, a square like cut of the tips, um, which is changes things up for my front of the house. But at the same time, we're increasing volume with grab and go. So therefore I don't think my front of the house is going to miss, you know, miss the, the money that is going towards the kitchen. And quite frankly, I don't want anybody working for me who doesn't think that the kitchen deserves part of the, those tips. You know what I mean? Like this is squarely a team effort. Um, and just in giving, giving a 20% tip share to my kitchen, that'll raise everybody's salary by like ten to $15,000 a year, which is a lot for a line cook. And we're, I'm already paying 18 to $20 an hour over here. So it's not like my dishwasher makes 15 plus tip share. So everybody here is making way above minimum wage and our prices, our prices are really reasonable. You know, they don't really reflect the high uh, labor costs that we're incurring. So it's, um, at the end of the day, we talk about wage disparity. We talk about why people don't want to come back in the industry, why cooks don't want to come back in the industry. Um, I believe as business owners, we have an opportunity to fix it, but we need to address the, the rising cost of operations with our customers directly and say, hey, you know, your prices have increased, but let me tell you what you're paying for. You're paying for this person to have health insurance. You're paying for, um, you know, we're, we're getting all our food locally. So you're supporting local farmers, local agriculture. So there, you know, there, there are plenty of reasons why I can, I can justify um, a higher price on the food. And it's something that I think the, it's not so much the customer, you know, they're used to spending a lot of money, but I think there's also 
when you look at a restaurant like Robin's or a restaurant like mine or like uh, Ed Kenny's, for example, like, you know, there is integrity in the fact that we are supporting local. We're sourcing everything fresh. We're not using frozen product and trying to pass it off as fresh. Like those are mm-hmm. those are hallmarks of our business and our brand that we continually try to cultivate. Um and so at the end of the day, when, you know, we're talking about go, things getting back to normal, um, the way that I think for the restaurant industry to recover, we need to have more of that conversation with our customers to say, like, this is actually the cost of doing business. Um, and I think some people understand and they're happy to pay more and they're happy to tip more and support and they get it. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that. And then you always get that people who are like, no, you know, like that guy at Taco Bell should not get fifteen dollars an hour, and it's like, why not? Is your is your meal not worth this person making a living wage? You know, so it's customer. I think customer attitude. Um, just kind. Of, it would be nice to enlighten our customers as to as to what really makes the restaurant world what what makes it happen. You know, like there there's so many moving parts, and there's a lot of money and heart and soul that goes into it. Uh, but again, the customer really only sees what's on the plate in front of them. I mean, I always wondered why our industry was, is like the last and only industry, maybe like the hair, the, the nail salon, that's a different conversation, but why there wasn't a livable wage, why, um, there wasn't like retirement 401k, um, like like just sort of regular hours like our cooks our cooks work four days a week so they have a 10 a 10 hour day they have four days a week like leanne our wages are exactly the same um the dishwasher uh, they get they get tipped they get tipped anywhere from 15 to 20 percent on all 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 sharing with the front of the house and they make they have a quality of life you know, they have three days off. Um, we gave Emily maternity leave when she had a baby. Um, it was very important for us to stress this business to do things that no one else did for for me or for any of my female counterparts when we were in industry. And I just, you know, like you go to see your attorney or you go to your accountant and everybody in that office is getting paid a livable wage. So why isn't it the same in the in the restaurant industry? We're not like idiots, you know. We work really, really hard. It takes a lot of brain power to run a restaurant or to run a profitable business of any kind, you know. And I think that for a long time, people just thought that okay, you work on a farm or you work in a restaurant, you're like not that smart. But it's not true. You're. I think that because of our industries and you're like dealing with like equipment you're and then the farmers have to deal with the with with the nature with the weather right (laughs) and they have to respond to that so it's like responding in real time to real things things break oh my god there's a new pest that shows up oh my god we don't have this ingredient like well we're not gonna lie you don't get to have chicken today because all the mongoose killed all of Julius's chicken. You know what I mean? Like, and when you when you tell these stories to the guests, they're like, "Oh yeah, no chicken. Okay, I'll come back another day for the fried chicken." And I'm like, "Yeah, you know why? Because you don't get to go wherever you want, whenever you want, and have whatever you want because that's just not reality." You know and. And it's taken, we've really, we've pissed off a lot of people in the first couple of years that we're open, but we're like unapologetic about it. We're like, sorry, like we have, we're running the restaurant like we run our house, that we run our family. And we're not gonna please everyone, but we're gonna do our best and we hope you enjoy it. And, and, and then that's that. And we love, we love supporting local because and and telling the story like it's so much less stressful than than like running like oh my god we're out of zucchini now we got to go find zucchini right and then lie and then like pretend for this one day that it's local like it's so stupid it's just, it's like not even worth it so we just say okay we don't have any soda today fine and it's so much easier so much easier 
It's also great that you guys have that integrity because I know not all restaurants do, right? So, well, well, and you know, it's in the news now, right? Like everyone's mm -hmm. getting caught, right? Like, and I think it's the problem because, you know, someone gets like a lot of media attention and then the people come and then all of a sudden there's all this pressure to perform and to like, you know, oh, I traveled all the, I saved all my money for this special occasion. Just be real. Just tell people. Be real because it's just going to catch up with you. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's someone's going to say something at some point. Right. Yeah. On our, on our farm for us, um, we, we made a commitment to do a minimum wage at $15 an hour. Yeah. Um, and we do provide um, benefits, um, health care, dental, all that um, for 1K which is a really big thing for, for me. Like, I was like, wow, I got a 401k. <laughs> like, and, um, but it really shows the, yeah, the integrity of the, the team here, you know, and I, have, I work with amazing people and I have amazing mentors here. Um, and, like, to, in the end, it's like, we really want to take care of our people, you know, and, and as much as we can, um, pay people for their work, you know, and for their hard work. Um, for our programs, our um, internship programs, because they if they're in our leadership program, um, they get a they get a their tuition full tuition paid at Leeward Community College, and then they get a monthly stipend starting at five hundred twenty five dollars um, in their first semester. And how we've set up our pay scale for them, um, the their stipends are all like fundraised and donate like not donate, mostly fundraising and like kind of grants and to work in the program mm -hmm. um because we're a social enterprise nonprofit, so it's like it's really the how our farm is really intertwined with mentoring young people teaching about um food systems about organic ag and producing food really producing food and not just using mm -hmm. it as an internship for an experience but really being a part of a deeper impact to providing food for our community um here on oahu um so after their first semester um, they get an opportunity to, well, they have two GPAs on the farm, basically. So they have a farm, uh, their school GPA, which is like a, up to whatever, 4.0. And then we, create, we created an evaluation system, um, scoring system for the performances on the farm. Um, and they get a GPA evaluation score on how they perform on the farm. And we aggregate those two, and then that's their pay scale. So um for their for their um base for their stipend and if they get extra if they ap apply to do extra hours to work on the farm the farm will pay for that and not that won't come from grants or fundraising the farm will pay for those extra hours because then they're working on the farm's time so but that yeah. those extra hours there there's a whatever they aggregate is their pay scale so so to incentivize and to show them the power and the rewards, right, of doing good work where you balance in school and you balance on the farm, right? Mm -hmm. And it even gets better if you influence your peers to do the same way, right? So it's not about only in, like, individualizing. There's a individualized um, kind of um, pay scale for them you know, as an individual, but it goes even more up um, if they get to influence others to do the same. So it becomes more of a community effort, becomes a team effort because we know if you have a you have a thriving team, a happy team, the work get the work gets done a lot more easier. It's not gonna say it's gonna be harder. I mean like like be super easy, but it makes it so much more enjoyable, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. being in a I, I can't imagine being in the back of a kitchen, but like being out here in the sun, you know, it makes people it makes it makes makes it enjoyable when people are happy. You know, maybe the work is hard, you know, and it's mm -hmm. Like I think in 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 our, our line of um, Hana, you know, it's like we do it because we love it, and I and I compare it a lot to sports. You know, we do it because it's it's just I think people overlook, um, you know, um, prefer like um like being a chef or being a farmer as not striving for excellence, but I think it's in these lines of works where all we're doing is striving for excellence, 
every, we, every we day want and we want the best plate of food we want the best radish to come out of the ground mm -hmm. we want the most beautiful kale to to be on people's plates and be people's on people's smoothies right so that even that you guys were talking about earlier about transparency of like what it takes to grow the food and put it on the plate that transparency is super important and that starts with our own team right mm -hmm. that starts mm -hmm. with communicating with our interns, with our staff and our direct co-producers co that we have, like whether it's through restaurants or through um, grocery stores to our farmers markets, you know, through our CSA program, that transparency is super important to have empathy for each other, right? You know, cause we, we get it, we, I feel bad sometimes when I'm like, I gotta tell somebody like, oh, I don't have this for you. And they was relying on us, you know? Yeah. And like, I feel really bad sometimes, but it's like, okay, what can we do? Or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make this commitment to you in the next two, three, four weeks when, when product comes up, right? And, but that's, that's, it makes it easier than just like, it just makes it like more doable, you know, because things happen, you know, mm -hmm. and bringing that clear, like just having that clear and understanding, like, for me, it's like, when I think about when people are trying to communicate, it's like sometimes I feel everyone is trying to say the same thing. We're just saying it in a different way of our own understanding. So it's like, how do we connect those conversations, those thoughts, those practices and show like, hey, we're doing the same thing, you know, but mm -hmm. let's just try and connect on a different level of understanding so we can get to where we want to go and be better, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I love... I love coming to work every day. And I, I think that what, what Cherie said is so important. Like it, she enjoys her work. And I think, I think um, that's the difference. What we wanted in, in this kitchen is that to bring people that they can enjoy their work. It's not, we're not like holding hands and going kubaya like all day long. It's hard. It's stressful, <laughs> but we enjoy it. And then, but again, like I think about those days where I just like, again, like just, having this feeling of wanting to like just be like physically sick because I was so stressed. Like I don't want anybody working for me to feel that way ever, you know? And I, I would feel that way at jobs in New York City too because because it was so intense and it was so misogynistic and it was so miserable. Um so I like I love that Sharice said that. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I was like um that especially on Ma'o, you guys tend to see it as a whole holistic. You see it more holistically as a community, as like because these are all changes that are really deeply ingrained and hard to change and they don't really happen in maybe not even one generation, right? So, um, so I think we tackled a lot of challenges, but I, um, coming out of COVID, do you think there's anything any exciting opportunities because of it? Uh, I think I think we're all glad to just be working. I mean, honestly, yeah. there's it's it's uh, the 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 word of the day is pivot. <laughs> um, so we, you know, I think for everybody, uh, male and female alike, and 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 just restaurateurs and farmers and our industry in general is just really, really happy to be, you know, coming out of this, uh, people are getting vaccinated, you know, it's like our industry was so quickly decimated in such a short amount of time. Um, and again, recovery will take time. Um, but within that, what you are going to see is, you know, new opportunities, you're going to see new entrepreneurs, people have had to figure out how to adjust, you know, and adapt adapt and adapt or die essentially, you know, so it, it becomes a situation where, you know, we've had, I know so many people who, you know, had five restaurants and now they have one, you know, and, um, you know, we came super, super close to closing down Coco head, you know, thank goodness for PPP loans, but, um, it was a choice, you know, like, is it worth it? Is it worth it to try and keep this open? Is it worth it to, you know, try and make this, survive uh for whatever reason you know and and those are discussions that are always really hard to have um at the same time i'm super stoked that you know we, we we've managed to make it through the pandemic and you know coco head is still on a reduced schedule or five days a week but we're okay with that you know like and we'll go <laughs> it's fine right 
it's you're funny. Gonna get, you're you're going to get mad at me because I'm closed on Monday, I mean, Tuesday. Like, so. Helena's, Helena's is, I just want to remind everyone that Helena's is open four days a week. And you know what? And closes at seven, they, right? Right. They make it happen. And you know what? It's so good. No one cares. And the people who can't get it together to like, they can like complain all they want, but it's fine. Yeah, fine. Yeah. High five, girlfriend. Good for you. <laughs> High five. Yeah, you should just I'm keep so, it that way. I got yes. some of those over here, so it's it's a little nuts. Um, well, you're in a hotel. It's different, you know? I think, you know, again, I think the one thing we have to be conscious of, and I, I will say the one thing that I know that I probably need to address sooner than later is I totally have PTSD from last year. Just like COVID, um, the fact that, at one point last year, it was me and two other people running a restaurant by ourselves seven days a week. Um, literally, I haven't stopped working since it happened. And, you know, I feel that my mental and emotional health has suffered. Uh, I, I'm still in the thick of it, for sure. Um, just because I still don't have a general manager at my restaurant. I'm still running like a 200-seat restaurant by myself, for the most part. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're trying to hire help and we're trying to find help. And, and, uh, thankfully I have a great team of people, uh, here at Papa Ina, but it's, you know, there aren't enough of us and, uh, it's, you know, I spend more time here with my employees than I do with my, my, my toddler and my husband. And that like wears on me like constantly. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I'm like about to get all teary eyed because of it. Oh. Um, but, um, you know, I, th I think that's really one thing that coming out of COVID, so many people got to, you know, were forced into uh, unemployment. And, you know, I was very, you know, I'm very grateful that I still have uh, my job. But at the same time, other people were forced, you know, they're, they're kind of like they, they could reassess their lives and say, mm. does this make me happy? Do I want to go back to what I was doing pre-COVID? Um, mm. You know, which is why we aren't seeing so many restaurant workers. Um, but at the same time, you know, this is what I know how to do. This is what makes me happy. All I all I ever wanted to do was create, you know, a, a, a place that would be safe and happy, healthy employment while we're making incredibly delicious food for our customers. You know, it seems like a simple thing. Um, but, you know, I think coming out of this, I, I'm well aware that, we need to address our mental health. We work a lot. And I think as women, we certainly take on more because we, we do take on that, that maternal role to our employees. Um, I don't enjoy yelling. I don't enjoy, you know, but it's like, I resolve conflict. I solve problems every single day. All day, you know? all day long. All day, all day. You so, talk all day. I like, at the end of the day, I'm like, I cannot talk anymore. <laughs> occasionally occasionally like for somebody like robin like she'll get somebody like me who cruises by midday at like 4 p.m i'll be like let's have some wine you know she's like okay she has wine she has wine i am so jealous <laughs> what's the so point of being in a wine cellar if you can't drink it yeah. I, right? I just want to i want to sum up my my post covid takeaway I, there's a lot of takeaways but i'm going to sum it up into um I, I'm relearning how to create boundaries for myself and then thus the business. Because when you start a restaurant or you start a new business or when you have a child, it's like a wild pony, right? You're just like on this ride and it's just taking you here, taking you there. And you're reacting to all these things that are coming toward you. And I couldn't untangle myself from that. So the pause has allowed me to sort of like, like, like create boundaries and going back to what you were saying, Leanne, about like educating the guests and, and, and having them be on your side. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Having we them need be cheerleaders. on your side. Yeah. yeah about yeah. like understanding the livable wage, understanding like staying hours for the business owner or for the, you know, especially the, the, the business owners that have children or kupuna that they're taking care of. Right. So that's, that's my big takeaway. Yeah. And I guess for me, quickly, I think um, when when everything did for when when everything shut down, you know, and there was just a uh, massive um, demand for people getting product directly from farms, you know, so it's like 
for us, our CSA program kind of went skyrocket and other people like, you know, FarmLink, where well, they went skyrocketing and like trying to mm -hmm. provide food. And it was like, it was like, for me, it was like, we were trying to say this for so many years, right? Buy local, right. And help support, right. you know, and, and support so local businesses. And then like, it just like, boom. And I was like, whoa. And like, we were ready. Like for like mm -hmm. the timing, it was just all timing. Like we had enough produce to help supply in those dire needs in the first, you know, in the first like two to three months when every, every, everyone was like looking for how to access local food. And we were there and then like, it's just, it was like, it was mind wrecking. It was long days, you know, it was just like up at three in the morning, harvesting vegetables, coming home at seven. And you're like, holy crap, I'm gonna do it again tomorrow. <laughs> yep, you know? and, again, and, and, and again, and again, and again, and it's just like, but that, that to me, like for me, it was so much fulfillment because it just yeah. to feed people, right? It's like it's it's a whole different experience when people come up to you. Like when I started going to the farmers market, and and customers would come up and be like, "I I can't go without your kale. Like I can't go without your salad." And it's like, and like it, we would say like, "Oh, we don't have it this week." They're like, "What?" like so the same reactions like probably what you guys got like with the chicken there's no chicken what no chicken it's like well this is what happens right but you know to be able to provide somebody with food um and during that time it was is absolutely crazy but so fulfilling fulfilling and to us um it just showed us the potential of like what we can do as a farm and not just only us but like in our local farming community like like we all can come in come together to feed feed our communities right to provide for our local businesses like we can do it you know it's just um educating people about how, how to make a little bit um you know their choices not say better choices but understanding the choices that they do have the impact of like what their dollar does um for a local business and keeping that dollar um in a local financial financial system is so important you know so like edu keep on educating our people our interns about um creating these you know localized systems of supporting each other right so it's like we tell our young people when they first come on oh we sell to these guys these guys these guys go check them out or go go to you know like somebody like um you know monkey pot is pretty close in Koli, and i say oh go to monkey pot and go try like they have you know they have this this and this from us and then they go there and they to me, as a farmer, nothing is like one of the like highlights of my life is like when I go to a restaurant and I eat something that I've grown. That you grew. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, oh my god, you taste! This. How did you make this taste like this? You know, but it's a mix. It's like it's it's the aloha. It's the it's the soil. It's what happens when you guys cook it and prepare it. Like all, it's all that. It's all intentionalized, and you taste it, right? You can have you know when somebody has bad juju and the cooking rice and the rice comes oh, a little bit sour, funny. right? Yeah, it comes <laughs> funny. It comes funny, but, you know, it's like when, you're, when your auntie's in the kitchen and your, your grandma's in the kitchen or your tooth's in the kitchen and, and you just take, it just tastes different. It hits different, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, for us, like for me, what, what it helped to highlight is like there's so much potential for us as local, local business owners, local farmers to fulfill those needs for our people here it's, it's just a constant battle of like making sure that we educate people constantly and being transparent you know of like where their dollar is going and and sometimes it's even more than a dollar sometimes it's words are so powerful for a human being especially what you know when we had to do this distancing and you know hugging people like I, I like I think if I hug a person I'm probably gonna cry you know it's like <laughs> that just having that interaction with somebody is so important right especially when you're yeah. When you're when you're celebrating with food, right? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I think um, we're entering into the Q and A portion now. So we have one. We have a question. Okay. With social media changing the game, how do you balance food presentation when it's all for the gram? It's a question from Aaron Hansen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I tell my cooks, basically, I'm like, everything has to be Instagram ready leaving the kitchen. That's really it. I'm like, every almost, you know, at least 50% of your tables are going to spend the first two minutes just taking photos. And I'm like, you know. Uh, Do you ever not prepare a dish then because it might be too ugly? Oh, yeah. 
I mean, like we have to figure I trust me, like the like I the first time I went to eat at um a pied de cochon up in Montreal, like everything was brown. Like the entire meal was brown. It was delicious, but I really wanted a salad, you know. So um, we try and balance, you know, the the brown and the fat and the richness with a little bit of green. Um, but essentially, yeah, everything I tell my cooks, I'm like, if it doesn't look like if you wouldn't eat that, if you wouldn't serve that to your family, if you wouldn't serve that to your mother, then don't serve it to a paying customer. You know, like everything has to look good, has to taste good. Um, so. So, yeah. So for the for the gram, we're always thinking about the Instagram. <laughs> I'm oh, I'm terrible I'm terrible at posting anything like I just the joke between um, Emily Gucci is our chef de cuisine and she she works the morning and she has to leave to pick up her her young daughter and so like whenever we're running and do this she's like take a picture take a picture send it to me and I was like oh my god we're just like scrambling to get it to the guests and so like it's I'm such a spaz I know I have to work on it but um, to answer your question Aaron we my husband handles our account. He does a really good job of it. I can't. I'm oh, too Chuck busy is, working. I can't do it. I didn't know Chuck was the gatekeeper to the Fed social media. Well, the, the Fed <laughs> social media, but but Robin Lee social media is like you know, ah, this is a whatever. <laughs> Love hate relationship. Yeah. Or I mean, yeah. I, I, I think at the end of the day, like both you and I. Robin, we use tweezers only when it's appropriate and called for. <laughs> so, I well, um, the big joke yeah. is I I'm so old. Well, I and I love being my age. I'm not. It's not about that. But I I went to culinary school and started cooking so long ago. No one was using tweezers, and so my cooks are like, "Chef doesn't like to use tweezers." And I'm like, "Not true. I cannot use them. I don't know how to use them. You can use them. I cannot." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. For the gram, I think for you guys, you guys have it, it has to be presented nicely. I just pull something out of the ground and it's dirty and people love it. No, that's, 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 that's sexy. That is, people love that. So sexy. Love it. Just repost Ma's photos. <laughs> oh, I think that's all the questions that we had. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. So post-pandemic, has your philosophy and priorities on the dining experience changed? That's an interesting question. Yeah, almost what what even is a restaurant anymore? What is the dining I mean, experience? I, mean, I feel like what's happened since the pandemic has happened and we've had people eating in the restaurant again, we have two different kinds of people. We have, and it's like polar opposite. There is like, a, and I hope this is the majority of the people are like super gracious. They're so kind. They're so nice. They're so happy to just sit in the restaurant. And then there's this like other group of people and they're just so not nice. Mm -hmm. They like treat, they treat the wait stuff like servants. They complain about everything. They don't understand. They, they, people still think that we have a small menu, which I, I think is completely insane. They have no idea how hard it is to make food, how time consuming it is to make food. And I'm thinking to myself, who are these people over here? They need to stay home or open up their own restaurant. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Is it um, equal amounts of both or? No, no, no. Thank God this group over oh. here is much okay. smaller than this group. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think again with uh, the, as I said, I, I'm moving forward. I'm actually changing over from a, uh, full service dine in brunch to going to a quick service model. We had actually planned and built this like almost like Starbucks like counter before COVID even happened. Um, and it's been sitting empty and unused because only just now are we starting to see enough volume where we can justify the cost of like starting, you know, doing the quick service. Um, but within that, you know, again, I think my goal is to really connect better with the customer in terms of, you know, subtly educating them on what they're paying for, you know, and, and that goes, it's a conversation on our website, on the check at the counter, um, that basically says, you know, we, 
we purchase everything local here. We support local. We pay a living wage to all our employees. We pay health insurance for all our employees, you know, like we, you know, the increased price we have to spend, you know, we're spending thousands of dollars on PPE now and, and takeout containers and paper goods all cost more with the rising costs in the world that affects everything here, you know? So it's, it's, again, I think there are ways to subtly educate your, your guests. Um, and, and really still wow them, you know, um, mm -hmm. for instance, I have a You're fruit plate. Out. You're just going to leave though. Just uh, a little bit. Um, I have a yeah, fruit yeah. plate that is, I think we have 22 different fruits on it right now from the state of Hawaii. Uh, you won't find a fruit plate like this anywhere in the state. Um, I literally go to the market twice a week and source this and I get, you know, fruit from adaptations, fruit from all my farmers in Maui. I'll go hand pick it. I have fruit from my backyard that I'll bring in. Um, so cool. but the, the, the connection that I have when I bring that fruit plate to my guests and I explain every single piece of fruit on the plate to them, they're just like, Oh my goodness. Like it's, I, I think it's like 14, it's $14 for the fruit plate when really I should be charging like 25 for it because it's, mm -hmm. it's literally an experience, you know, and I probably could charge more for it. And you would pay for that experience of having at least half a dozen fruits that you've never had before. You didn't even know what they were, you know? So, um, that is part of that experience. And again, educating the guests as to like the value of what they're paying for. It's not just what you're eating. It's, it's the experience of discovery. You know, it's the idea that like step out of your comfort zone and try something that you've never had before, you know, and see if you like it. So, um, I think my philosophy has changed in the sense that I want to not just make del delicious, beautiful food, but I also want to connect with the customer on uh, a deeper level to really say, you know, this is really, you know, there, there are so many people who are making this, magical fruit plate happen for you including you know the the dozen farmers who are growing things like loqua and langsa and rambutan and uh black raspberries and poha berries and suriname cherries and all these things outside of pineapple and papaya you know because i can't even tell you how many times i'll i'll, I'll go to somewhere and get a piece of cantaloupe and blueberries on my plate and i'm like I don't understand. I'm, I'm in Hawaii. <laughs> like, I don't understand. Um, you know, and so, again, it's, it's about the messaging. And, and, and when people see that, it's like, yes, I work with over a dozen different farmers to make this happen for you. So I want deeper connection with my customers. <laughs> I want that fruit plate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Coming over for it. Yeah, that fruit plate sounds amazing. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, thank seriously. You. Why don't more people do it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I know why, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Question from Christine. Um, yes, continue to educate, and the guest public will learn. To educate, and the guests and public will learn to adapt and know the value of fresh food. It's time to appreciate those who feed us from farm to restaurants. Yay! Yeah. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> I'm Kathy. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. You ladies are all so awesome. Thank you for bringing great food from the Ma'o Farm to your amazing restaurants. I am a fan of all of you. So happy you made it through the pandemic. <laughs> Keep going, you girl, girls, girl power. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, Nezia, what advice would you give to our youth, especially those who just graduated high school, on how they can get started in the agriculture and food industry? Good mm. question. Yeah. It's easy. We're all hiring. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah. If they just graduate high, high school, they just miss an opportunity to come to the farm. But there's next year. <laughs> or there's winter. There's winter for here. We do another recruitment in winter. Um, but there's great okay. programs now at UH West Oahu and learning about the, they have a sustainable, um, sustainable community food systems program. So if mm -hmm. people are looking for a degree to understand the food system um, with, learning about indigenous values and the social economical um, parts of like creating a more robust and healing our food system um, with Hawaii yeah. um, history and intentions. It's a great program to start if people are really interested about getting a bachelor's degree in food systems. Mm. 
that's a great I, I, I would say I would say to youth, be picky. Do your mm -hmm. homework. Don't just walk Do into your a homework. place. Do your homework. Don't just walk into a place and take the first job that's offered to you. Like go stage, which means go spend a day at multiple places so you can get a deeper understanding of the environment, the culture, the the people that you're going to be working with. Don't just say yes to the first job that's offered to you. Find the job that you want. Find the mentor that is going to take time to work with mm -hmm. you, to understand who you are as a person and what your goals are. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important is, is, and that's a conversation to have with each and every one of my employees is like, you know, like, what are you doing? What are your goals in life? What are your, what's your end goal? Like, why are you in the hospitality industry? And for some people, this yeah. is a lifestyle and a career. Other people, it's a means to an end, but either way, it's like to understand somebody's motivations, I think is really important. So as somebody who's just getting into the job market for this t first time, I, I recommend do your homework. More homework. Yeah. <laughs> Great advice. Do your research. <laughs> This is by far the best virtual panel I've attended this entire past year. Oh. Super important insights, inspiring, and empowering. Big mahalo. Aw, thanks. Sweet. Thank you. Oh. Oh. <laughs> thanks, Hiff. Uh, <laughs> what are some of the solutions in Hawaii when it comes to food equity? CSA, the CSA program from Ma'o is a great start. Yeah, I, I mean, think, I, I, yeah, go for it. No, go, go ahead. I was oh, going to no, say, yeah. the... Um, I think it's amazing that they're accepting like SNAP and WIC at the farmer's mm -hmm. markets. Mm -hmm. I think that's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, so what we saw was, um, you know, farms like Ma'o and, and so many other communities, especially, you know, all over the islands come together to really feed the community in terms of CSA boxes, donations to food banks, mm -hmm. um, donation of product to, you know, working with chefs to, to get those meals out to Kapuna and Keiki, um, I think just the what's interesting is that, you know, throughout throughout history, basically when anybody needs something, they need uh, they have a charity or they need something. They they talk to restaurants. Mm -hmm. Right. And us in turn, we have to go to our farmers. So um, right. what's amazing was to see all of our farmers here in Hawaii just really just they're like, you know what? we have food we're normally selling it to restaurants but we're going to give it to our community because we don't want it to go to waste and i think that was that was just just to see how the community pulled together and to see um other players you know here we had uh kyle kawakami from uh maui fresh streetery obviously there's chef hui on uh honolulu but to see how the um industry players partnered with farmers to make sure that that food got out there. I think that was incredible. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and Charisse, thank you guys so much for, for Ma'o's continued generosity to the community. I mean, Ma'o's always, Ma'o's always been amazing. So yeah. <laughs> you've been trying, it, it's, it's, it's a, a definite team effort and you, I mean, and you know, Ed, Ed's been a great friend for us for a long time. And I know you guys are friends with some of our friends and we hear, you know, we've kind of been in each other's circles for a very long time. So, you know, like when the call is, is there, we like in the end, we want to feed people, you know, yeah. like, it, you know, this, yes, we we're we're business and trying to make ends meet, but, you know, to share food and to make sure that people are fed is, I think as a farmer and as a, as a chef, right, is, is core to like our, the foundation of why we do what we do. We're a big part of it. Yeah, I feel like one of the most heartening things that came out of the pandemic was the, especially is the Hawaii Island Food Bank went up to 70% of locally, local, locally farmed ingredients to give out. Right? And I think that's the goal that they're going to continue moving forward to really create that system to help both mm -hmm. the farmers, but then also feed the pe feed people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, okay. So thank you so much for your time. I think we're wrapping up now. Um, I'm gonna have Anderson close. Hi everyone, thank you so much for participating in this panel. It was a great, very enlightened conversation. You know, a lot of big questions. <laughs> and you know, I think it's just a matter of like, especially with this pandemic, you know, there's a reckoning and re-examination of how we do things, especially in Hawaii and stuff like that. And uh, 
you guys are all absolutely survivors. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully this is, uh, you know, this is, you know, when, when we reflect on the way we do things in Hawaii, uh, when it comes to industry, the way we feed ourselves, you know, the way we, we work, I think hopefully, um, you know, we, you know, we, we can um, kind of carve out a new path, a new, especially a new sustainable path um, and not kind of fall back into the trappings of relying on the usual things that we always, always would do in, in Hawaii. So thank you again so much for being part of this panel. And just to, you know, just, just to, to wrap things up, you know, um, with the Eat Drink film, you know, again, this virtual showcase ends on Sunday and just a quick housekeeping uh, for HIF, you know, we have um, another uh, festival next month, the Viva La Cinema, uh, which is our kind of French uh, festival, uh, which will be entirely online. And then August, we have our iHeart HIF uh, membership drive. Um, so we'll have a big announcement regarding that. And also stay tuned for our, our big show, the 41st annual Hawaii International Film Festival presented by Hale Kalani on November 4th to the 28th. And that's gonna be a hybrid event. So we'll be in theaters online and also other events around the around the um the island and also on the other islands as well especially uh, on maui uh, hawaii island and uh, Kauai. so stay tuned for that and we have some big announcements regarding that and also we will have our eat drink film section as part of that festival as well um so it'll be a lot of fun um you know it's just great again to <laughs> have interact with people again and like be in theaters and hug people and be in line and have this discourse and just talk story. So hopefully we don't have to do it in front of our computers and we can do it in real life. So yeah. again, thank you so much uh, to Chef Leanne, Chef Robin and uh, Kawi from Mao Farms and also to our amazing uh, moderator, Martha. Uh, we can't do it without you. And uh, we really appreciate all the work that you've done. Uh, and uh, you know we wish you well and uh, we will support all your restaurants and initiatives and programs and uh, for a better Hawaii. So without, so to, to end things on, um, on that note, thank you again, <coughs> see you soon. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you. Mahalo guys, super appreciate it.